Hello everyone and welcome to another Stat for 37 lecture video. In today's video, we're going to be looking at fitting marginal models using generalized estimating equations in R. So we're actually going to take a real life data set and we're going to take the techniques that we've been discussing for the last number of lectures and we're going to apply them and we're going to see how can we fit models to the data to estimate the parameters but also how can we test hypotheses, how can we interpret parameters, what do we want to watch out for, all of that good stuff. So the data that we're going to be working with is posted on the course website, of course. Now it is COVID-19 test data from Ontario, so that's also available directly from the Ontario government if you want. And I'll note while we're talking about this right now that all of the data that we're looking at in this course, as well as data sets that I won't have time to go over in lecture, are posted to a data file on the course website. and. In that uh, folder, there is an R file that tells you what you need to know about the data. So it gives you a breakdown of what all the columns are, and it tells you how to read them in into R itself. And so you can take a look at that and you can play around with it to sort of get a hands-on feel for some of the techniques we're talking about, even if we haven't looked at the data in lecture. There's more, more data up there than uh, sort of I'll know what to do with, and it's gonna keep growing throughout the rest of the term as I bring in new data sets to work with. So the goal of today's analysis is to sort of look at binomial data, binomial longitudinal data, and try to fit some models to that. So in these data, we'll take a look at in a second here. Uh, the idea is that they're from the different public health units around Ontario, and it has the daily numbers for the number of tests that were run, as well as the proportion of those tests that came back positive for COVID-19. And so the idea is that we're sort of going to be fitting this binomial model, right, where you can think about each of these tests as being run as uh, sort of a, a, a realization from a binomial random variable with a certain number of trials, and we're sort of trying to estimate the proportion of positivity. And so we're gonna see those data, we're gonna sort of take a look at individuals as being public health units, and hopefully this is sort of a topical and relevant uh, version to look at this. But so with that, I will open up R over here. And so we can get started. So to begin, uh, what I'm going to note is that we're going to be using this GEE pack library here. So I can load this in and that should load in for myself. Again, if you don't have this installed yet, you'll want to install GEE pack. And the first thing to note is that uh, our main function that we're going to be taking a look at is this GEE GLM function, right? And so I can pull up the documentation for it. And, you know, again, there's the full documentation. I'd encourage you to look through it, but uh, as you can see, when we're taking a look at it here, all of this documentation is pointing us directly at GLM. And so the really nice thing about this function is that with the uh, exception of specifying some correlation structures, which will come down here and specify, all of the sort of standard parameters that you're used to fitting are going to be based on those GLMs. Now, there are ways of sort of doing it more flexibly, but in the video where we were introducing some examples of GEEs, we saw that the way we're gonna normally go about this is by taking inspiration from a specific kind of GLM and then using that to you know, specify our variance function, specify the link function. And this is gonna take care of all of that for us very easily, okay? So I would get GEE pack installed and then I would download the data that's on the course website. So I believe that if I set my sessions working directory correctly, then I should be able to just read in this COVID data file here. And so, yeah, that loaded in correctly. Uh, it's this Ontario by PHU CSV file that should be available on the course website. Okay, and so the first thing we'll do as we normally would is I'll just take a look at the uh, uh, head and we can scroll down here and you can see that we're given the ID. This is an ID for the individuals, which in this case represents a public health unit. We have the date as well as a time index. Now this time index is just going to be a value uh, that starts at zero on the first day that's measured in the sample and counts up from there. We have this estimated population um, column, which is a column that I added to the data based on some of the values in that the, uh, that the province reports. And it's just an estimate of how many people live in the region. It's not gonna be exact, but it sort of lets us compare, is the public health unit a large unit or is it a small unit? We report the positivity rate, and so this is the rate on the day, as well as the test volume, so how many tests were run on that given date. And so obviously, the positive positivity rate and the test volume together, sort of we're thinking of as um, binomial 
uh, distribution, binomially distributed data. Now, there is one thing about this GEE GLM function that I oftentimes forget, and then I start getting weird outputs from the uh, models. And so I would remind you to do this, but it actually expects our data frames to be sorted first by ID and then by time index. Now, I believe that the COVID data already is, but just to show you what that looks like and to get in the habit of doing this, the idea is that um, we can use an order function. Okay, so the order function in R is going to return uh, sort of the ordered list of indices based on uh, whatever factors we provide. And so I can say order by COVID ID, and then um, the other relevant column is time index. And so this order here, um, if I output, say, the head of it, you can see that it's just going to give us um, an outputted list of indices. And so I select that ordering rows, and this is going to sort that data frame. And so I'm just going to call this as my first bit here so that we don't have to worry about uh, any issues that are coming up because the data aren't ordered. So now we have the data read in. We've sort of seen what the structure of it is. We've ordered it correctly. If we want to start modeling this data, it makes sense to start with a plot of the data. Okay, just to sort of give us a sense of what are we expecting to see. And so what I'll do is I'm going to plot the positivity rate and we'll plot this by time index and we'll say that the color of it, and maybe I'll space this down to make sure that it's legible. Uh, we'll say that it's colored by uh, say the ID, okay? And um, the reason we're using as factor is just to make the coloring come out correctly. We'll want to specify that the data is going to be COVID and then the type we'll set as point so that we're not getting lines. And I can run this and it's going to take a moment here and we're going to see that we get this fairly incomprehensible plot here, right? So we can sort of start seeing some patterns, right? These lines, these green lines that are popping out above the rest are a little bit easier to track, but obviously there's um, quite a lot going on in this plot. It's not the most legible. so. You know, we've seen a few different ways of plotting longitudinal data already in this course and on the first assignment you were asked to do this. But so what I want to do is to actually just plot a random sample of this data. Okay, so I'm going to say select a random sample. And the way that I'm going to do this is just sampling some of the indices. So I'll say sampled index is going to be a sample and we want the unique of the COVID IDs, right? So this is going to just return all of the different IDs from the data set. And then sample is going to pick randomly from that. Uh, let's just say that we want to take five and we'll pass false because this is whether we want to sample with replacement. And we don't want replacement because we might end up with two of the same. Um, I'm also just going to set a random seed here just so that the plots are reproducible. So all this is going to do is that after you call set seed, when you start generating random numbers, it's always going to start with the same random values. So then this way, if you run this code with set seed, you should get exactly the same results that I do. Okay, so we can um, come here and we can take a look at what the sampled indices are. And so you can see we have these five random indices. And maybe what I want to do is plot an XY plot, right? So remember, that's from the lattice package, and it's the XY plot. And so we can start by specifying what the formula of the plot is going to be. And so we'll do positivity rate by the time index, and that's nested within ID. We want to specify that the groups are going to be ID. The data is going to be COVID. And now what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to specify this panel function here. So it's going to be a function that takes X and Y, and it's going to sort of allow us to um, plot different functions across the panels. So um, the lattice package offers a number of panel functions, right? So you can see some of these cropping up here, and it's going to be a lot of the types of plots that you're used to. Um, but so I'm going to do a panel of an XY plot, uh, and it's going to take XY, and it's going to be type of point. Okay. And then I'm also wanting to do a line plot. Okay, so I'll go panel line plot, we'll take XY. Now here, we need to pass in the function that we're going to call in order to generate the line that's going on top of it. So we'll pass in, say, the mean. Uh, and we want to pass in horizontal equals false. And uh, let's say specify the line weight is going to be, or the line width is going to be uh, two. Uh, and we can specify a color if we want 
I'll just say color equals one. So I'm going to run this code. Um, and let's see. Need to pull over my plot here again. Let's try and run it now. We're getting some sort of error. Uh, okay, so sorry about that. I uh, had to do a quick little bit of debugging here, and it turned out that I had some strange configuration of my R Studio, but I also had some issues with this code. So it's not actually going to be a panel line plot, which is what I had typed out before. It's going to be panel line join. Okay, so that's the first issue. The second issue is that I realized I didn't even use these random indices that we sampled up here. So what I want to come down here is in addition to saying the data is going to be COVID, what I want to do is I want to pass in this subset parameter. And the subset is going to be uh, ID in sampled index. So this is just going to take the subset of all of those observations that occurred in that sampled index that we had. And now I believe that if I run this, we should get this plot generated. Okay, and so you can see that we've generated a panel for each of these different um, uh, of the five randomly sampled individuals. So we can sort of see these trends developing over time. Now, um, it might not be the most informative to have been separating these off by the different IDs here, right? And so uh, instead, maybe we want to do something about, say, the size of the plot, right? So one thing that we could do is we could come in here and we could say add a size factor. And all I'm going to do is think about uh, categorizing the size of the PHU best based on the estimated population. Except instead of treating that as a continuous variant, what if we say we wanted to put it into, uh, you know, some, some fixed number of different uh, categories. So you're either in sort of the smallest or the second smallest or the third smallest or and so on, right? And so uh, in order to do that, we're going to make use of a cut function in R. So the cut function is basically going to take in a uh, vector of numeric values, and it's going to assign each of those numeric values to a class based on a set of breaks that we give it, right? So the vector, the numeric vector that we want to take in is going to be uh, the estimated pop. So it's the estimated population, and we want to specify where the breaks are, or uh, you know, alternatively, we could specify the number of breaks that we wanted if we wanted to break up the data evenly. But I want to sort of control that a little bit, and so I want uh, to break on these quantiles, right? So we'll just uh, assign a factor based on whether they're in the first quantile of the estimated population, the second, the third, or the fourth. Okay, and so I'm going to get the quantiles of the unique estimated populations. Um, and so what this, oh, I'm called unique twice here, quantile of unique of the estimated populations. And the idea is basically that uh, we're going to transform the estimated populations into numbers one, two, three, or four, depending on which quantile that observation belongs to. Now we need to include a, a few other factors or parameters to the cut function. So the first is going to be uh, include.lowest, and we're going to set that to be equal to true. And what this is going to do is whether or not uh, we're including factors in from the lowest level. So that's going to make sure we don't get any NAs. And then I want to specify labels equals false. So if you specify labels equals true, then instead of it being a numeric value that it assigns it to, it's going to assign it to sort of a label that includes the whole range. Um, and then finally, I want this to be a factor variable. So I'll call as factor, and uh, we can sort of run this code, and that should define our factor variable here. And if I just view the COVID data frame quickly, you can see that we now have the size factor where um, you know, we're going to have ones for the uh, PHUs that are smaller. And if we go up to size four, these are going to be larger estimated PHUs. Okay. And so now that we have this factor defined, we can sort of think about taking this plot that we had uh, done here, right? Um, and now instead of nesting within the IDs for the ID variables, we could think about nesting inside of the uh, size factor, for instance. So I could change this to size factor here. We could run that. We're going to get this plot generated here. And um, you can see that we're getting out to this plot where it's nesting within the size factors instead. 
Okay, and um, here, if we're doing that, we probably wouldn't want to subset the sample any longer, and this plot might take a little bit longer to generate, but now you can see that we get all four levels represented, and you know it's going to be a little bit here to refresh because we have quite a few observations, but now we're sort of getting back to plot that, uh, that might give you something useful to see. So uh, I think the key takeaway so far from these plots is that we, of course, see this wave pattern that we've all become used to, um, but also there's a lot of data here, right? Um, it's taking a long time to draw these plots, uh, and they're not necessarily super duper easy to work with. And so we're going to end up finding that trying to fit models on this full data, at least for the sake of a lecture example, is going to be quite a lot. And so what I'm going to end up doing is subsetting our data quite heavily in order to uh, sort of have useful um, estimates coming out. But, uh, you know, if you're running this yourself and you have a little bit more time to let these models fit, you could think about doing this without uh, these major subsets. So what I'm going to do here is actually define sort of, we'll start modeling, right? And I'm going to define my basic model and I'm not going to end up running this model, but I'll show you what we sort of want to be able to do. So I'm going to call it the basic model. And uh, as I was mentioning, it's the GEE GLM function. It's going to function essentially like a GLM call. And so the first thing we're going to provide is the formula. And we want to predict, say, the positivity rate based on the time index, the estimated uh, population, uh, maybe a interaction between the time index and the estimated population. Um, we're going to specify that the family is binomial, just like we would for the GLM. We are going to specify that the data is COVID, right? So that it knows which data frame we're working with. Now we need to specify our ID variable. And so just as we have been so far, the ID variable just represents, uh, you know, what is the personal identifier? So that's ID, capital ID. And then we also have to specify this core stra, uh, which is the correlation string or the correlation structure. And the idea is it's just going to be a character string and it's going to represent one of the correlation structure structures that we talked about. Um, and so if we actually, so I'm trying to get the help option to show up here. Um, but if uh, essentially all of the different correlation structures that we've talked about are available. So you can see independence, exchangeable, AR1, unstructured, and user defined, right? And so all I'm going to do is let's say we want to pass in the exchangeable correlation structure, right? So we're assuming a single correlation parameter. Now, as I was mentioning, this model is going to take a long time to fit. So you could, you know, try it out yourself, but the general, uh, you know, results from these data, there's 600 and something days worth of data in, in the file, and we have 34, 35 PHUs, right? So it's sort of a lot of data to be working with. And so instead of trying to fit the whole uh, data set, instead what I want to do is just think about doing the last 20 to 30 days. So I'm going to filter on the time index being at least 580. Okay, and so basically what we're looking at there is the last sort of four weeks worth of data and doing that is just going to let us um, sort of fit these models in this video. But note that doing something like this is actually going to be sort of more uh, what you would be expecting to want. Okay, so uh, I can add in this subset and the subset I'm going to take time index greater than or equal to say 580. You could play around with this. This is going to work out okay for us. And now I think that if I run this, I might actually end up getting an error. And so I'll try that. And if so, we can talk about it. Uh, oh, well, of course I have to type in COVID correctly. Yeah, okay. So um, this specified is not actually going to work as you might expect, or maybe maybe you wouldn't expect, and you're sort of yelling at me that you know uh, what I'm doing is a little bit silly here. But the issue is that this positivity rate isn't actually going to be the way that the GLM call expects the binomial data. So there are two sort of different ways. If it's going to be binary, uh, either ones or zeros, you can just pass in whatever column has the binary realizations. In our case, what we're going to end up wanting to do is pass in a two-dimensional vector where the first column is the number of successes and the second column is the number of failures, right? And so how might we be able to do this? Well. Uh, I'm going to sort of save myself some time relative to how I was doing this before. So the code posted on the website might be a little bit different, but I'm going to call or uh, define a COVID success um, 
And success means a positive test for COVID here, right? So that's probably not actually a success, but I'm sure you, you're, you're used to that language at this point. And the idea is that we want to take, uh, say, the integer value of the um, COVID positivity rate times by the COVID uh, test volume is what we call that column. Okay. And so we can run that. And that's going to define, if I just look at the head of it, that's going to define uh, this, where we have the number of positive tests that we're returning and rounded down. And then I'm going to have a COVID failure, which in this case is negative tests. So, you know, and we're going to define that to be the COVID uh, test volume minus COVID successes. So anything that was not a success is a failure. And now what we can do is we can come in here and instead of saying the positivity rate as our outcome, we can do a C bind of successes and failures. And now if I run this, I believe that should fit the model. It does. That's great. And um, we can sort of just take a look at the plot of the uh, basic model here, right? And this is going to be a diagnostic plot, much in the way you were used to seeing diagnostic plots for GLMs. So this is, you know, one of the nice things about uh, this package is that we get all of this plotting information. Now, if I'm looking at these residual plots, these Pearson residuals, it does look like we're probably missing some structure here, right? And so perhaps a quadratic trend of some sort, which might also make sense if you've sort of seen how the uh, positivity rate has been taking off recently. And so what I'm also going to do is in addition to this basic model that we fit right here, I'm also going to come in and include a quadratic model, right? So I'll just copy this down. I'll call this quadratic, quadratic model. And then instead of time index and estimated pop, uh, and then the interaction, I'm actually going to delete those terms because if we're specifying it with this star, we don't need to explicitly specify the main effects. And I'm going to say time index plus, and then it's the indicator of time index squared, or not the indicator, the I function here uh, sort of evaluates this expression and I can fit this quadratic model. And now we've fit the quadratic model to the data as well, right? And so you know, I could perhaps consider just plotting the quadratic model as well. And we can see, does this look any better? That's going to give me an error because I hid away my plot here. But if I plot it, you can see that that's probably slightly better than the plot we were looking at before, right? Which has this larger curvature. Uh, it's still not perfect, but it's going to be good enough for us to work with for the sake of this video. Okay. So the other thing that we might want to check is whether the exchangeable correlation structure is really sort of a a good correlation structure for us to use, right? Before we start testing this model and putting it through its paces, right? We've ex assumed exchangeable. Uh, is that an okay assumption? Now, this is where we're also going to bump into sort of real world data problems of uh, just time it's going to take to fit this model. So I did some quick uh, fitting before running uh, this video. And on these data, if I wanted to fit with um, out filtering down the number of IDs that we were looking at. And I just want to fit on these last four weeks of data. It takes about two and a half minutes for me to fit the model for um, a, uh, a sort of a relaxed correlation structure. And so that's not going to be super great uh, to show you in this lecture video, right? And so all of the times I've included are posted on the code on the Learn website. But the idea is that if we really wanted to test whether we wanted to use an unstructured correlation, we could. I'm just going to not have the time to do that. So instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is test whether an autoregressive structure works better. Okay. So I'm going to come down here and instead of uh, fitting a quadratic model, I'm going to call this AR, right? And I can pass AR1 <clears throat> as the core structure here. And so the idea with the autoregressive is that it is slightly more flexible than the uh, exchangeable, right? Because we're not assuming constant correlation, we're assuming that the correlation decays. And actually in this setting, it's going to be quite a reasonable assumption. But <clears throat> so we can fit the quadratic model like that. I also want to take the basic model and refit it using an AR as well. So I'll come in, paste this here, change this to be AR1. I believe that's actually supposed to be lowercase. And instead of calling it basic model, we'll call it basic model AR. Okay, so I can run that. That should fit fine. Quadratic model should fit fine as well, right? So now we have these four different candidate models, and we sort of want to know, you know, which of these models are going to be acceptable to run or to use. And so, you know, we can do some model comparison here. And if you remember from the theory video, the uh, 
GEEs are not a likelihood-based uh, method of fitting models, right? And so because of that, because they're not likelihood-based, we can't use likelihood ratio tests. Now, we do still have some options, and I'll show you those right now. But remember that we can't just straight up perform a likelihood ratio test because we don't have likelihoods computed. So the first thing that we can use is the quasi-information criterion, uh, which is sort of like the AIC or the BIC, but it's computed based on this quasi-likelihood that we've been using. And so we could take a look at, say, the QIC for the quadratic model and a QIC for the quadratic model, uh, quadratic model with the AR term. Right, and so I can run both of these and you can see that we get a bunch of values output here. Now, the QIC and the CIC are going to be most useful for us when we're selecting a correlation structure, which is what we're doing right now. The QICU is going to be most useful for us when we're trying to select between two different models that have been fit with the same mean structure, but with different, uh, or sorry, with the same correlation structure, but with different mean structures. So when we're selecting based on correlation, uh, we want to use the QIC or the CIC. If we're selecting based on the mean model, then we want to use this QICU. And the basic idea is lower values are better. Okay, so we can see that for this quadratic model with the exchangeable assumption, we have uh, whatever this is, 35, 5, 7, 8, and we have about 9,000 if we use the AR term. Right, and same thing with the CIC over here, we have 17, 5, 12. The CIC over here is just over 4,000, right? So in both cases, the uh, quadratic model with the AR term seems to be preferable because it's substantially lower. Um, so even though it's a little bit of added complexity, it seems like we're, we're actually gaining something here. Now we could do the same comparison with our basic models, right? So I could do basic model, output that, also take the basic model AR and just see if we're not using the quadratic term, um, do we get the same results? And the answer is gonna be yes, right? So we have 73,859 versus uh, just over 23,000. And then for the CIC, we have, you know, 36, almost 37,000 versus 11 and a half, right? So the AR term is much preferable. And so we're going to be using this AR correlation structure. And that also sort of makes sense if you've taken a time series course, right? But the, um, the general process here is quite straightforward, right? We can just compare these QIC or CIC values, and those are going to be helpful for selecting the model, right? Now, the other question that we could ask is we have this basic model AR and we have this quadratic model AR, right? And those are sort of the ones that we're trying to choose between and they're using the same correlation structure, but they use a different mean structure, right? And so if I take a look at these two, we can compare these QICU values to determine which is preferable. And so you can see that the quadratic model actually has a slightly higher QICU than the uh, linear model here. And the reason is that it's getting penalized for the parameters and these extra parameters aren't really helping it all that much, right? And so in this case, we would actually say we may as well just take the linear model because it seems to be fitting the data just about as well, actually, you know, uh, and because it has so many fewer parameters, that's sort of preferable for us. And so really, if we were using this QIC uh, criteria, we would end up selecting this basic model AR to, uh, to work with going forward. Right? Um, so that's kind of interesting. Now, a lot of this is going to change depending on exactly where you draw this cutoff point. If you go back another uh, little while where we were in the previous wave, you're going to see that sort of more strong quadratic structure is necessary. And if you go back even further than that, then linear models nor quadratic models are really going to make sense because we sort of have this um, these, these wave structures, right? So where we set the time index is going to be uh, important, but in terms of setting it here, we actually would take this basic model as sort of the model that makes most sense for us to use. Okay, so uh, an alternative way of sort of going about this is to use this size factor, right? So maybe we're interested in knowing, do larger PHUs or smaller PHUs report different positivity rates, which, you know, you might think there's there's good reason to believe that that could be the case. So what I'm going to do is I'll, I will fit this factor, factor model AR. Uh, and we'll sort of work through this process fully again. And so we'll say that the formula is going to be, the outcome is the C bind of success and failures, right? And here, what we wanna do is essentially uh, take, say either a linear or a quadratic trend. And instead of using the estimated population, we could use the uh, size factor that we fit, right? And so I'm gonna still work with a, um, 
quadratic term, even though we said that the basic one was better. And the reason I'm doing that is just because sort of from subject matter, we might be interested in this quadratic term because, you know, again, that, that 580 is quite arbitrary. Um, and so I'm going to multiply that by factor of the size factor. You probably don't need to wrap this in factor, but I'm doing that just to be safe in case anything went wrong with my uh, code above and it's stored as a numeric. Uh, again, the family is going to be binomial. The data is COVID. The ID is ID. Uh, the subset, we want time index greater than or equal to 580. And the core structure, we're going to use this AR1 that we've been assuming. So the only thing that we've swapped out now is instead of using the estimated population, we have this estimated size factor here. Okay, so we can run that. That runs quite quickly. And we could actually just take a look at the summary of this model, right? So we haven't actually looked at a model summary yet. Um, but if I expand this up, you can see that this is going to look quite familiar. So we have our call up here, right, which is just the information we provided. And then we get all of our coefficients estimated. And so you can see in this case, we have our time index, our quadratic time index, and then we have the main effects for factor level two, three, and four, and then time effect times by those, and then quadratic time effects time by, times by those. And we're going to get the estimate, the standard error, the Wald statistic, and the p-value. Okay, so we could actually go through and test how does the significance look on each of these, and we can see that these are looking quite significant. Now, what I would point out is that this Wald statistic here is not actually going to be the normally distributed Wald statistic. So it's not given by the estimate divided by the standard error. It's actually the chi-square distributed version of that. So it's the estimate over the standard error, that whole thing squared. Okay. And so if you're trying to figure out where's this Wald value coming from, it's this value divided by this value squared. Okay. So these values are going to follow a chi-square distribution instead of a standard normal under the null hypothesis. Okay, and so this output should all look familiar. But then we also get down here our estimated correlation structure, right? So we can see that uh, the scale parameter, that phi parameter, we have this estimate of 0.0039 to 0.004, but it's got a standard error of 0.0007, right? So perhaps even though it's a small value, it's still significant. Um, and then we also have estimated the uh, correlation parameter, which in our case is 0.693. And remember that AR structure is going to be based on a single correlation parameter, but then it does that DK over time, right? So that's how we would actually sort of look at the model output there. Now, if we were interested, we could see, does uh, using the factor, does that work better than using the estimated population as a whole? Now, in fact, we're actually sort of fitting with more terms when we include it as a factor, right? Including anything as a discrete is, is um, you're going to require multiple parameters, whereas before we were assuming this linear trend. And so we would expect actually that the factor model is less parsimonious than the corresponding uh, quadratic model, right? Um, and so they're using the same correlation structure. We would look at this QICU, and you can see that the factor model has a 573, the quadratic model has a 563. And so once again, you're going to be looking at, well, the uh, quad or the factor model it would not be selected based on this criteria, right? Um, and that's mostly because it's fitting with twice as many parameters, right? So we require a lot more parameters to estimate and it doesn't really improve the situation. Now, despite that, there might be a reason that we want to fit this factor model anyways, right? And to sort of emphasize this point, what I wanna do is I want to just define a, uh, a value and I'm gonna call this large. And all I want this to be is a uh, one if you're at the in the largest quantile and a zero otherwise, right? So I'm going to say COVID size factor equals four, right? And so I can run that. And now basically this is just a binary indicator of were you in the largest quantile? And now what we could do is we could use this term to test whether the largest uh, PHUs are different from the smaller versions, right? And so what I can do here is I can come in and I'm going to steal this factor model code here. And I'm going to call this a binary model. And instead of using um, this, this size factor over here, what I want to do is I want to include, say, the estimated population and a size factor. Okay. And so the idea is that basically we're going to fit that standard quadratic model we had been using, but we're also going to include an interaction term for the large values. And so what this is saying is that we're assuming there's this linear relationship. But if you're in a larger um, cohort, 
then you can change sort of dramatically from all of the other uh, PHUs that are available, right? And we'll keep everything else exactly as we have been. We'll fit this binary model here. And we could actually come and take a look at the QIC of the quadratic model, uh, AR, and the QIC of the binary model. And what we're going to find is that once again, simpler model is preferable, right? This QIC has 15 parameters in it, right? So it's actually quite a lot more sizable. But even though it wouldn't be the model we're selected if we're just looking for the best model, there might still be a reason why we want to use it. And the reason could be that we want to test whether or not that large, uh, large values have a significant difference. And so if I just look at the summary here, you can see that we have a uh, oh, summary of the binary model. Oh, this is quite strange. Did I include? the wrong formula here. If I come up binary model, we're fitting with the success failure estimated pop. Oh, okay. Well, this is a size factor. I wanted this to be large. Okay. So we're going to fit that model again, instead of using the size factor. Now, if I were to look at the QIC, I actually do believe that the binary model QIC is still not preferable. Um, so there's the QIC of the binary model. There's the QIC of the quadratic model. Uh, and so you can see, yeah, the binary model still has a larger QIC U. Um, and it's because it has more parameters, right? So, uh, but now if I were to look at the summary of the binary model, get to the point I was actually trying to make, right? You can see that we have these interaction terms between the time and, uh, so there's the quadratic time and the regular time. And you can see that at, uh, sort of a test of, of significance for each of these factors, they wouldn't return significant, right? So it doesn't look like there's actually a difference in time effect between the large, uh, PHUs and the smaller ones. But what we want to know is, is this uh, sort of time effect zero between these two, right? So like neither of these uh, appear significant on their own, but perhaps the combination of them can't be zero, right? And so we want to test this formal hypothesis of whether these two beta terms are equal to zero. And the way that we can do this is using wall-based hypothesis tests, right? And so as we've seen before, we're going to generally set up an L matrix here. And if we're testing a hypothesis of, uh, we have, you know, B, I would have to count out exactly which betas these are. But so if we have the intercepts beta zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, so it's beta six, beta seven, beta eight. So beta six equals beta eight equals beta or equals zero, All right? That's our null hypothesis. And so we want to set up this, uh, matrix here. That's going to have a one in the sixth the beta six spot, a one in the beta eight spot, and then we're going to test that whether L beta equals zero. So I actually have this matrix pre-typed out so that I don't make a typo here. Um, but you can see there's one in the six spot, one in the eight spot, and otherwise it's just all zeros. Okay. And so now what we want to test is uh, we need the beta hats, which we can grab as the coef from our model. So that's going to be the binary model AR. We can test uh, the L beta under the null hypothesis is going to be zero, zero, right? If beta six and beta eight are both zero, then L times beta should be zero, zero. We can take our estimated covariance matrix to be uh, given by this V cove function here. And we're just going to pass in our binary model AR. And so we can define our test statistic here. And remember, that's going to be the transpose of L times by beta hat minus L beta. Multiply that by the inverse matrix of L times by our estimated covariance times by the transpose of L. And then we multiply this whole thing by uh, the L beta hat minus L beta. So we've done this a bunch of times. These walled statistics are still valid, even though we're not using likelihood um, because it does not rely on that. And I just realized I did not actually run all of this code, but you can see we got our W statistic here. It's going to be 8.09 and we're going to be testing this against a chi-squared of uh, two with two degrees of freedom because the rank of L is two. So our p-value is going to be one minus p chi-square, w degrees of freedom equals two. Oh, not q. That should say one. One minus this. And you can see we get a point oh one seven five, right? And so we reject the null hypothesis that beta six equals beta eight equals zero. And we conclude that actually there is significance uh, there's a significant difference between the large PHUs and the small PHUs, right? So I hope that was a somewhat clear run through of uh, sort of how we're going to go about fitting this. In the next lecture, I'm going to actually do the same thing again here, except using 
Poisson count data, right? So we're going to run through this. We're going to be a little bit more familiar, so I'm not going to need all of the same background, but we're going to do some model fitting, some hypothesis testing, and that type of thing with some count data. So um, I would check that one out as soon as it goes online as well. But again, if you ever have any questions at all with any of this stuff, please reach out and ask me. All of this code, all of this data are posted on the course website, and I will see you in the next lecture.